Welcome back to my channel, the best place for ambitious millennial professionals who feel stuck in their careers to find their dream careers. In my previous video, I covered what the bamboo ceiling is for Asian American immigrants to the West and how it hurts their careers and a lot of the data that is relevant to also the second generation. If you want to dig deeper into some of the underpinnings I'm going to be talking about in this video, definitely go back and check out that video before starting this one. And it's always good to understand what your parents sacrificed and went through by coming over here and taking the immigrant bargain. In this video, I'm going to cover the five major points on how 1.5 or second generation Asian Americans also face their own unique bamboo ceiling challenges, even though they grew up in the West. And the fourth point is going to make the difference on the key reason why Asian Americans are stuck with the bamboo ceiling, even though we're totally linguistically and culturally fluent. Make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell to receive regular updates on all things related to bringing a positive change to your career. Hi, I'm Dr. John Tam, and I'm passionate about helping ambitious millennial professionals build their dream careers. So without further ado, let's talk about the bamboo ceiling for second generation Asian Americans. So I want to do a quick recap on some of the qualitative and quantitative data on what we know about the bamboo ceiling of Asian Americans. This first point is a snapshot of the several key points from the last video. So feel free to jump to the next section using the timestamps below if you've already watched that. However, I once again, highly recommend you to go back and watch the last video to get a real deep read of this research because I explore it a lot deeper there. This is kind of like a bullet form version. So Asian Americans are 12% of the professional workforce while making only 5.6% of the US population. Asian Americans are also the least likely racial group to be promoted in Silicon Valley's management, in white collar jobs, in government jobs, and pretty much everywhere else. In Fortune 500 companies, there's only 12 Asian American CEOs and Asian Americans also have the lowest associate to partner ratio of any racial group. Research from Professor Reza Hazmath about the ethnic penalty has found similar results in Canada, where non-Caucasian groups average 25% less income than their Caucasian counterparts, with that spread increasing to almost 40% once people hit their 40s and 50s. Now that's the numbers data. Now for the qualitative aspects of the bamboo ceiling. I'm gonna dive a little bit into neuroscience. Implicit bias is real though even the ones who design the implicit association test can't really prove it actually results in discrimination because our slow brain may stop our fast brain from acting upon our biases. I talk a lot about the slow brain and fast brain and diversity in this video up here. But here are some common implicit bias stereotypes that are backed by research. Asians being good at math, Asians not being able to socialize, Asian men being effeminate, Asian women being submissive, Asians being weak, Asians having poor social and soft skills and Asian men can't project confidence, they're technically competent but not in leadership, they're not creative and they only memorize and so on, right? All of these are typical Asian stereotypes that you hear. Asian men also tend to be stuck in a lose-lose situation. Evaluations may include you don't speak up on the one hand or you're too aggressive on the other. What is assertive for a white or black man becomes overboard for an Asian. Female Asian Americans get a double jeopardy. What is assertive for a man becomes aggressive, shrill, and bat poop crazy in a woman. It's basically a situation where it's impossible to win. And these are just some of the implicit bias stereotypes that we're facing on top of the Fu Manchu crap that men have to deal with and the fetishization of women that I've talked about in my previous video. My second point is Asian American second generation are born in the West with their parents coming over and signing essentially the immigrant bargain. And as a result, they become the model minority. So when first generation Asian Americans come over, they sign what sociologists Vivian Louie and Rob Smith call the immigrants bargain, which is bringing the families over so their children can have an opportunity to fulfill the American dream. The parents will take a hit, but their kids would be in a position for success in the West. Asian American parents will then have language barriers at work and they tend to work long hours and also lack of a network and information on how their kids should proceed in education. And so as a result, Asian Americans circulate a methodology called essentially the Asian American playbook. And that idea is basically work your butt off, excel in school, excel in all the extracurriculars, get a perfect score on SAT and get into the top universities and you're going to be set. And this has by and large worked at the educational level. Asians are able to dominate getting into top schools. I don't really need to show any stats because it is quite evident with the class action lawsuit that Asian Americans are putting together against affirmative action, uh, especially in the case of Harvard. But on top of the Asian American educational stereotype and all of that, there are also many international students coming over from places like China and India. And these are all the cream of the crop. And the people that are coming over from India and China essentially constitute one third of the human population, right? So these 
these are the creme de la creme of that group. Not to mention that Western universities love to create pointless graduate programs as cash cows for international students who they can then charge three to four times the usual tuition to you know, keep their institution running. At the end of the day, many non-Asians simply will not be able to tell the difference between South Asians, East Asians, locally and from overseas. All they see is that there are so many Asian college students at top schools that further perpetuate the model minority myth. And the success of Asian Americans really perpetuate what Mia Tuan calls forever foreigners or honorary whites. In her research, Asians essentially get categorized as honorary whites. So it's really bizarre to start seeing Asian Americans being lumped in the same category as the whites, because you gotta remember, like Asians also include Southeast or South Asians who may have darker skin. They're all seen as the model minority and it just fits quite uncomfortably with the whole discourse on race and color in America. Many people, including Asians themselves, will not be able to tell the difference between the Asian who grew up watching their parents in the sweatshops of New York's Chinatown versus the Asian children of gazillionaires who grew up in the monster mansions of Vancouver. So my point is, despite the massive diversity amongst the Asian American population, either for second generation or overseas students or whatever, they are all lumped together in the model minority category. And that makes it very difficult for the second generation to navigate. So the main point is this, the Asian American playbook to excel in school makes it difficult for Asian Americans to really stand out besides being the model minority because of the international trends of international students coming over because, you know, pretty much they're able to excel in school but beyond school has always been the main issue. And so the fact that the playbook has helped them excel in school gets them through school but what about in the workplace, right? Which is my next point. The Asian American playbook does not work in the corporate world. Margaret Chin from Hunter College published a new book called Stuck, Why Asian Americans Don't Reach the Top of the Corporate Ladder. And in her finding, she points to the Asian American playbook, which helps people get through education and generally helps people secure a job. This is basically the Tiger Mom stuff that Amy Chua was known for a while back in 2012. And I talk about it briefly in my talk here, which I'll put in the cards above. And so basically the Asian American playbook does not help Asian Americans climb the corporate ladder. It helps them get in, but not climb. Because it does not address leadership skills, stretch assignments, networks, and more. In a perfect meritocracy, this playbook will work. And in fact, the global West is probably a place where there's a very public position against inequality, even though the practice may be flawed. A lot of immigrant families come from places where inequality is overt and meritocracy can't even help break barriers. It's actually a lot better than a lot of places in the world where cronyism and nepotism is the norm and meritocracy really doesn't get you anywhere. So in the West, we're taught to study hard and tiger parenting hampers our ability to understand workplace success. So essentially, at the end of the day, it teaches you to be book smart and not exactly workplace smart. So developmentally, the Asian American playbook doesn't really teach you to blend in with another culture or you know thrive in a diverse environment. And it doesn't really teach you to experience athletics or things that would really drill on your soft skills. And even if you are a perfect Asian American, someone like Jeremy Lin who, you know, is aced everything in school, went to Harvard, and even made the NBA physically. There's also a physical discrimination to it as well, as I talk about in my video up here about Jeremy Lin and his bamboo ceiling that he faced in the NBA. And so the bottom line really does come back once again to trust and soft skills really promote trust. For the 1.5 to second generation, when they're promoted to the C-suite, they're perceived to be given a key to the organization. And when you are given the keys to the organization, people really need to trust you. Do you agree with that? Let me know in the comments below. And did you have tiger parents, by the way? Also let me know in the comments below. Which brings me to my fourth point, which is the implicit biases that people have towards Asian Americans can get manifested in the workplace, right? And I wanna introduce you to Susan Fisk's stereotype content model. And essentially the X axis is competence while the Y axis is warmth. And Asians find themselves in a stereotypical box of being high in competence, but low in warmth, right alongside other categories like the Jews. So based on the diagram, the emotions it invokes are envy and jealousy, and we occupy the rich and professional and technical expert class. You can also peruse the other categories at your leisure. However, the main point is to simply remember how these stereotypes are perceived in America. And to be very clear, I'm not saying that these stereotypes are actually true, but in the corporate world, the problem is that 
At higher levels, there are plenty of competent people to choose from. It is often to distinguish expertise, especially if you yourself are not an expert. For example, the average person can rarely tell a difference between an accountant who is a seven versus an accountant who is a nine, right? Especially if you, you don't know what you don't know. And oftentimes when you start promoting people in your company, it's very difficult to tell between an eight and a nine or a seven and a nine because they're all excellent and the soft skills can cover a lot of these competencies. And therefore, the key differentiating factor becomes trustworthiness. And I discussed this in detail with my friend Riza Hazmath in multiple interviews and I'll put them in the cards above. So definitely trust is a major factor when it comes to promotion. On the contrary, if someone who is competent but not trustworthy is promoted, that will actually be perceived as dangerous. Asians are stereotyped to be in the competent but untrustworthy group, which is the bottom right hand quadrant, which puts them at a disadvantage in terms of climbing the corporate ladder. They are perceived to be competitive and closed. My fifth point is that it's a self-perpetuating cycle and Asian Americans need a new playbook. Margaret Chin actually argues for a new playbook for Asian Americans to move from the junior to middle and senior level positions in corporate America. In the first playbook, the emphasis is on hard work and to overcoming adversity. However, can hard work overcome the lack of trust? A lot of Asian Americans decide to prove themselves by getting another degree and you work even harder and double down on the work that you're good at. You may excel and you may even go back to school to get that certification, right? But the problem is this, the question has never been against your brain. The stereotype is not against your competence. The problem has always been about the stereotype of Asian soft skills and in particular leadership skills. As stated before, both stereotypes for male or female Asian Americans don't bode well in the workplace. The fact of the matter is, you know, it's so easy for these implicit biases to come out, especially when people get tired and the slow brain just slows down. And that's where I would argue a lot of the racism and discrimination actually emerges was when people you know, let their guard down and these things just come out. And so the Asian American problem is that you're already overeducated and underemployed and what you need to boost are actually your soft skills and leadership skills. And so a lot of times when you start relying on the first playbook, which is get more education to break through that bamboo ceiling, it actually gets harder because you only double down on the stereotype. And as a result, a lot of Asian Americans actually become disillusioned with their work and they become entrepreneurs or switch to other industries because of these perceived stereotypes and systemic barriers they face. Many become lost and that's why also Asian Americans and Asian Canadians are often unsure what career path is the right one for them, right? Because education has always been about studying by the books and getting into the most lucrative careers. and so much less is placed on the self-discovery and just really, you know, what is it that you enjoy? And if you feel that describes you, I have a free training on how to find your dream career and I'll put it in the descriptions below. You can also take a free, quick and accurate career personality test, which I'll also put in the links below just to help you gain that clarity. If you are interested in making a career change, join my Facebook group, Career Change Advice, to be in a community of people who are interested in making their careers work for them rather than the other way around. And so with all the problems that Asian Americans face, Margaret Chin believes that the second generation Asian American playbook would help a lot, which is the focus of my next video. In my next video, I'm going to break down some of the proven strategies on how to break the bamboo ceiling, regardless if you're a first or second generation Asian American. So make sure to subscribe and click the notification bell for when it comes out. Also leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts about this video. Don't forget to give it a like and share it with your network if you found this to be valuable.